everybody. I'm Dweezil Zappa. Have you ever heard the phrase, wearing many hats? Well, my guest today has worn many hats, including a giant white mohawk on stage (laughs) with Michael Jackson. I mean, I guess it's kind of a hat. But today, I'm speaking with Jennifer Batten. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And then you took a totally different route in your career when you started playing with Jeff Beck, which I assume probably was very much the opposite and had a lot of improvisation and and changes. How did you end up working with Jeff? You got that right about being 180 different from the Jackson thing, where Jackson is basically it's worked out stuff. People want to hear what's on the record. Uh, whether they realize it or not, they know the EQ on the snare in Billy Jean, you know. So we took great efforts to recreate what what was on the radio that people had heard a million times. And then with Jeff, yeah, it is about improv. It's it's about the exact opposite. Instead of playing the exact same way every night, he wants you to, you know, light a fire under his pants and take tunes to a, a, a different place. And getting that gig was, it wasn't a dream I even had. I just wanted to meet him because I was such a fan. And at one point, I had learned every solo on the Blow by Blow record and the Wired record. And I thought I was going to do a tribute show until I learned everything and then got cold feet. (laughs) So that never happened. But I knew Terry Bozio. And I knew, well, it was the guitar shop era. And I connected with him and just, you know, I just put the word out. I want to meet this guy. I want to meet this guy. <laughs> and in fact, uh, when we were on the Bad Tour, one of the, the keyboard guys, uh, Rory Kaplan, had done some teching work for Jeff when he was touring with Jan Hammer. And he goes, oh, you're a fan of Jeff? I'll, I'll hook you up so you can meet him. And the bastard never did it. <laughs> so when it came time for the Dangerous Tour, when I knew we were going back to England, I thought, I know Jeff is on this island somewhere. And every gig we did around Europe, I would ask the Sony reps and Epic people if if somebody had a connection. And eventually somebody came through, invited him to a show we were doing at Wembley Stadium. And I was so excited. And two opening acts went on, and then Michael canceled the show. Of all shows, I, I don't know what the hell was going on. Because you got 80,000 pissed off people and crying children of people that had flown in from other countries going home disappointed. And they loaded the band in a bus and closed the curtains so nobody could see who we were. But I thought Jeff was still in the VIP tent. So all these people are coming out and I'm going across the flow trying to get to the VIP tent with my hair up two feet. Like it's obvious who I am. And I finally get to the VIP tent and it, it turned out that he was turned away at the gate because he came last minute just to see Michael. And they turned him away. So I I called him up the next day and I said, you know, I don't know when or if they're going to make up this show, but can I meet you anyway? And he he was very kind. I went to the uh, the studio that he was recording the Rockabilly record with the Newtown Playboys. I I remember I had one of those big honking video cameras way before smartphones. And I asked him to play Blue Wind. And he started playing it and my battery died. And I'm like, oh my, just shoot me. I grabbed my spare battery. And that lasted another 10 seconds before that died. (laughs) But in that time, when I saw him do that, it, it was an amazing education. Because although I learned that stuff and I played the same notes, I was not putting in the same nuance. It just opened up a, a whole new thing for me. At that time, my, my first record, Above, Blow, and Beyond, had just come out. And I gave him a copy of that. I got my autograph, spent a little time with him, and I thought I'd never see him again. And about a month later, I was home between legs of the tour, and he calls me up. And he goes, I, I finally had a chance to listen to your record properly, and let's do one together. And I just pissed myself, of course. You know, I would give anything to have a recording of that conversation because it was so magical and mind-blowing. And in true Beck form, you know, he was inspired in the moment, and then five years went by. Every time I saw him, he'd say, you know, we're going to do this thing. And I would think, yeah, well, I know what it's like to be inspired in the moment, and then you move on to other things, and it's okay. You know, just the fact that I was asked is enough. And I actually don't have to face this daunting task. And eventually he called me up and said, I got a tour of Italy. Let's go. And I thought he might be out of his mind because I didn't know anything about him as a person, really. And I had a session in uh, Milan 
for a techno gig. So I was flying over that side of the pond anyway. And I learned most of the guitar shop record, uh, booked myself to London to go to his house to, f to force an audition on myself in his presence to make sure he wasn't out of his mind. <laughs> So he had already hired you, but you're like, I still need to audition? Yeah, because we had never played together. At that point, he was going on the strength of two records. I had my follow-up record called Momentum, and that was enough for him. And I thought, man, that, that is a leap of faith. You know, I mean, he saw me play on the Jackson tour, but that that is night and day different from what is required for his band. But you know what's funny is that a lot of times certain artists – that particularly ones that have a lot of depth and nuance, they're seeing and hearing things that other people aren't paying attention to. So he probably already saw exactly what he needed in you, even though you didn't see it in yourself. And so I can imagine Jeff probably without having much question was able to go, Oh yeah, she could do this. I hear her do this style. This would work this way. Right. It's funny that you went that extra step when he was already convinced. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I didn't tell anybody about it because I thought, how much would it suck to say, yeah, I'm touring with Jeff, and then it doesn't work out. And I did the same thing with Michael Jackson. We were well into rehearsals before I told anybody. I was just canceling everything and irritating people. No, nope, still can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, honestly, because I was so into Jeff's music, I, I had the, the sounds. I mean, I, I was taking the place of Max Middleton, Jan Hammer, Tony Hymas, I mean, people of that level, and I did not see myself there. And when we did the first get-together, the original band actually was going to be um, Terry Bozio and Tony Levin. And they flew me into New York to SIR, and I go in, and I'm expecting to see a keyboard player. And it turns out it was me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, by the way, we, we have a little chore for you. And and Jeff was perfectly happy to have me play just guitar, and I thought, man, this is not going to work. With all those sounds from all those records, it's just not going to work. And I ended up with a guitar synth unit, and so I thought, okay, i, I got to dive in with both feet. And it was a hell of a learning curve, but um, I would say at least half of what I did, maybe more, was guitar synth. And just worked on trying to come close to recreating some of those backdrops because I, I think I think that's what people wanted to hear and I think if I would go see Jeff and it was just guitar it, it wouldn't cut it for me especially with those tunes you know it's in the DNA listening to blow by blow probably a thousand times yeah well it's great that you wanted to recreate those textures and I'm sure that's a reason why it worked as well as it did kudos yeah. to you now, speaking of Jeff Beck and Edward Van Halen, let's make a connection here. Do you hear any Jeff Beck in Edward Van Halen's playing? Well, I never thought about that. No, it hasn't hit me that way. It's funny because Ed often talked about Eric Clapton as his main influence growing up. But I don't hear Eric Clapton in Ed's playing unless he's playing straight up blues. And he can clearly mimic Eric to a T when he's doing that. When Ed's playing more like himself, I feel like the origin of some of his most exciting techniques in playing are linked to Jeff Beck. Okay. I hear it mainly showing up in phrases where he's using the vibrato bar yes. or he's playing open string licks or the the string bending that yeah. he does. His intonation and the way that he gets to the notes is similar to Jeff. Right. Yeah, you're right. Here's one last example, which comes from a backstage jam that I actually filmed in 1992. I was at the show because my girlfriend was the lead singer of the band that opened the show. The band was called Baby Animals, and Edward is playing a Strat owned by Baby Animals guitarist Dave Leslie, while the bass player Ed Parisi and the drummer Frank Salenza are playing the Mean Street groove. You can hear some laughter when Ed starts playing some mosquito sounds. Then he name checks Jeff Beck. It's fun to hear Edward playing with such ease. The Strat Ed's playing is set up like Jeff Beck's guitar. 
It has a floating bridge, and you can hear Ed talk about how fun it is to play. We got a fun falling out. Never really yeah. done it. One of my favorite things about the jam is the funk rhythm parts he played. They sounded so cool on that strat. This is one of the best jams I ever saw Ed participate in because it was intimate and relaxed. You can hear he's having fun. It's joy and freedom all at once. Later that same night, Edward invited me to play on stage with him. That was crazy. It was a really fun night because Ed was just hanging out and playing guitar and goofing off. <laughs> Did you ever talk to Jeff about Edward? Do you know if he listened to him or what he thought about his playing? Yeah, he got a, a little bummed out that you know when Eddie was at the peak, Jeff thought he was done. He thought that of his own career. He thought music was going in a whole other direction uh, with pyrotechnics and stuff. And I think the result of that thinking went into the Flash album, which was not the greatest album. You know, it, it's like he was working at doing something that wasn't him. That's how I see it. And when he got back to him, then he started blooming again and being adventurous. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of a funny thing there that I don't know if he'd want me to reveal, but it's out now. <laughs> With 30 episodes and over 50 hours of conversations and commentary, Running With The Dweezil uncovers the hidden details within the music of Van Halen. Check the blog at dweezilzappa.com for details about the upcoming Running With The Dweezil listening parties. Get your questions ready now. Running With The Dweezil is available exclusively at dweezilzappa.com, a reward music-powered artist site.